Hello, I'm Aminta Dawson with the ACES staff. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Applying Fair Principles to Ontologies, sponsored by DCMI. Our distinguished presenter is Dr. Maria Poveda, who will be introduced by our moderator, Ink Young Choi, teaching assistant professor at the School of Information Science at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I'd like to ask the audience to type your questions into the question panel box, and they'll be answered at the end of the presentation at the end of the presentation. I will now turn this session over to Ink Young Choi, who will introduce our presenter. Thank you, Amnita. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. Um, this webinar is the CMI webinar series, which intend to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, bring together the global community of metadata practitioner, researcher, and developer to share knowledge and other best practice around metadata. So today's speaker, uh, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Maria Povera. She is Associate Professor at the Artificial Intelligence Department of the University Politecnica di Madrid. And she is also part of the Ontology Engineering Group Research Lab. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Her research activity focuses on ontological engineering, ontology evaluation, knowledge representation, and the semantic web. She has contributed to multiple organizations for linked data and ontology. She is also part of the uh, W3C Web of the Things working groups. So this webinar <clears throat> address ontology for semantic webs and how fair principle could be applied to ontology. So thank you, Maria, for leading today's webinar and ACIST for organizing it. So now I'll have Dr. Maria to take over um, the webinar. Thanks, Ing Yun, for inviting me and uh, presenting uh, me and introducing to the to the audience. So as Ing Yun said, uh, I'm going to talk about how the fair principles uh, match the best practices or the practices we were already taking into account in the in the semantic web. So I might um, switch off my camera during the presentation to avoid a network uh, overload. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So before um, we start talking about the, the ontologies and fair uh, principles applied to, to ontologies, let's, re, uh, let's review some data setting principles that I say uh, we were using before in the, in the semantic web. So, in the first place, the linked data principles proposed by Tim Berners-Lee in 2006 uh, promoted uh, the use of URIs for naming things, that is, um, uniform resource identifiers, uh, HTTP protocol for sharing information about these identifiers of, of the resources for the URIs, and doing this uh, using standards like RDF and finally linking to other URIs. So later, these principles uh, were extended by the Link Open Data Five Star Scheme. So in this scheme, uh, it was uh, uh, clear that the first thing uh, to do when we are sharing data on the web is to make it open. That is why the first star said uh, on the web under an open license. And then. Uh, this principle, uh, this uh, best practice become mandatory to move from the linked data paradigm to the link open data cloud. Mm, okay. Then the fair principles were released as guidelines to provide findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. These fair principles are being adopted in initiatives as the European Open Science Cloud or the Interoperability Framework and the Research Data Alliance. And uh, we all agree that they have become um, uh, very important guidelines for sharing data um, almost in the or at least for the open science and other initiatives oh, yeah sorry yeah so there are some initiatives working towards ontology and semantic artifacts fairness but the question in this situation is how how do this effort with ontology engineering and the semantic web community match the fair uh, principles? 
In uh, a previous uh, publication, we suggested that there is a need for an open discussion about the technical uh, and social challenges and needs regarding the adoption of fair principles to be applied to these semantic artifacts. And well, I'm talking sometimes about semantic artifacts, considering also thesauri terminologies, uh, lightweight taxonomies, and sometimes I will focus on, on ontologies in particular. So how do we, this work fit fit with ontology ingenuity, engineering community and the semantic web best practices. So uh, I just include briefly here some names of these initiatives, but then I'm going to detail some of them later. And at the bottom of the slide, you have the, the conference paper where we were, you can find a more extended analysis. So to have an idea of the current state of affairs, let's review some of these initiatives for the se first semantics and recommendation for ontology publication. So I'm going to match, I'm going to try to match uh, these um, best practices and uh, recommendations to the fair principles. So on the top of the slide, there are the, the fair principles there. Uh, so from the initiative, uh, fair is fair. It is a, a European project, and in this project, uh, there is a, some outcomes that uh, provide 16 recommendations related to one or more fair principles. So, for example, um, a, a how to identify uh, or whether to provide global, unique, persistence, and resolvable identifiers for all the semantic uh, resources. About uh, how to provide or, or to provide metadata, including provenance, license, and so on. They also propose some um, like requirements, um, some requirements for uh, semantic repositories, like uh, how they, which information they could have, uh, how could they behave for um, understanding mappings, and so on also the use of standard languages and the declaration and use of mappings between the, the artifacts. So in the table, you can see how these uh, 17 principles and recommendations are related to the, to the fair principles uh, in, the, in the main row, the first row. So also from the semantic web and ontology engineering side, there are publications that provide guidelines about how to publish fair ontologies. So focusing on recommendation for coining URIs, generate documentation, publish ontologies following the, the best practices. For example, we have the best practices for implementing fair vocabularies and ontologies on, on the web. And as I said, it provides 10 guidelines for publishing fair ontologies and vocabularies. Also about uh, URIs, uh, doc uh, focusing on definition and design of URIs, documentation to be provided, both metadata but also human oriented, and how to po uh, publish them. And there is also another scheme uh, based on this five star scheme that is the, well, this, this was a blog post uh, from Bernard Batant. I will mention later also some work from, from this researcher. And it was published in 2012 and gives you an, a, an idea of the five star link open data, but for uh, vocabularies. And also uh, was about uh, providing URIs, open licensing, uh, license, human readable documentation, metadata, metadata for the ontology and for the, the terms, also publishing online and following the best practices, the, the content of the ontology and the documentation, and of course, linking to other vocabularies, that is to reuse other ontologies. And also there, uh, there has been another five-star scheme uh, proposal, uh, this time from the Semantic Web Journal, um, and in this case, it's also about how to publish the vocabularies and providing the human readable version and also the machine readable version, again, to link to other vocabularies and provide metadata. 
So if we were to, to analyze how this uh, how the best practices that we were already considering for uh, publishing, implementing and publishing uh, vocabularies and ontologies on the web before the FAIR principles and the, uh, its FAIR principle in particular. So we, main observations will be that uh, the, there are some principles that are not addressed like the uh, findable three that is about metadata and link data because in semantic web uh, normally we embed the metadata within the, the object. Also because uh, the, um, the principle access about accessibility that is about the protocol authentication um, that is uh, A1.2 you can see here that there is no no match with the best practices in the semantic web, but it's because we already set HTTP uh, as a protocol. So uh, it has a secure version, HTTPS, but um, it's, uh, we don't require this uh, authentication. And also the um, accessible principle two that is about having metadata available without the data. But as I said before, in, uh, in the semantic web, uh, most of the times we embed the metadata within the, the resource. And also on the web, um, we, the, the resources might become unavailable. So we, let's say that we count with the fact that in the future the resources might disappear. So we don't have this um, mindset of archiving. We just stop finding the, the information. So as I say, this is a um, very uh, fast uh, analysis of how the best practices we were using before match the fair principles. And now I would like to move about um, what are the, the open lines or what we should be uh, keeping from the semantic web or what are the, the needs uh, or, or what we still need to to discuss. So for each, for each principle, I will be uh, describing the practices that are uh, followed in the semantic web community and that we consider suitable for the fairness of ontologies or semantic artifacts. And then uh, we'll present the needs and then open issues for, for discussion into the semantic web and ontology engineering community. So, for example, uh, this is uh, about the principles uh, related to be findable. The, uh, you got the, the principles um, included in the in the slide. So, for this uh, set of principles, the semantic web community already uses uh, URIs to refer to semantic artifacts, but uh, it is uh, still pending uh, to discuss whether the um, whether mechanisms and authorities to coin persistent identifiers for semantic artifacts uh, should be established. I, and I mean, uh, we don't uh, really um, um, a catalog or we don't have authorities to catalog and, and, and ensure the persistence of our identifiers like a, DOIs, uh, GIOs for the for the papers or the publications that we have. So we publish URIs that they resolve uh, while they are um, maintained, and they are uniform. The the US for uniform, and we don't uh, intend to have unique. Um, globally unique identifiers and that is one of the basic um, mechanisms that we use in the in the semantic web. Also um, in practice the semantic web community already defines metadata in semantic artifacts however it is not needed to agree on the minimum set of required metadata to ensure their findability. Also, there is a demand for technical and practical guidelines for declaring metadata. However, it is still pending to discuss in which cases the metadata should be provided as a separate object, like, like we were to archive them or to have a repository of uh, metadata artifacts. 
or whether it is applicable only when the metadata is used by third-party applications, for example, the ontology registries and indexes. Because for now, when, when we publish the, um, an ontology, the metadata is included within the ontology um, code in most of the cases, and it will be duplicated in some registries if needed. And uh, finally, there is also a need to define federation models for semantic artifacts, but considering uh, models defined in the semantic web community. So, for example, um, we should reuse uh, DCAT and DCAT2 um, models to, to base the federation of uh, uh, models in the semantic web. Um, and also, regarding the federation, a possible approach could be to have a more technical federation approach, like the solid idea for both uh, solid. I don't know if you are familiar with the SOLID project from INRUP. Um, they try to decentralize the data on the web, making like the publisher or the owners of the data the main managers. And then we will have this idea of bots, that is personal and online data, that each person will manage their own. So we could have something similar for the vocabularies or the ontologies to be uh, to manage their own metadata in a decentralized way that, rather than in a centralized uh, repository. Yeah, so. so regarding the, um, to be, uh, the principles uh, about to be accessible, so we can say that uh, semantic artifacts uses already already HTTP and HTTPS protocols for naming and sharing uh, the artifacts. However, declaring and following preservation policies uh, for publishing resources might be a good practice. So to be, a, to be adopted by the semantic web community. As I said, um, so in the semantic web community, we publish resources uh, with metadata and indexing in, in other registries or applications that um, might be used as a proxy or as a as somewhere uh, to look for other resources. But uh, when when a resource uh, becomes unavailable, that is all and, and that happens. So this idea of preservation policies to at least to say for how long do you plan to to maintain the resource or whether it will be stable or not will be will help the um, uh, the, the functioning of the uh, semantic web resources. So regarding the principles related to interoper uh, to be interoperable, so there are uh, knowledge uh, in the semantic web we already have knowledge representation languages that the, uh, the, the community has defined for the semantic artifacts, as well as uh, methods for ontology reuse and mechanisms to reference uh, other ontologies that should be used. So um, in this case, uh, in order to make a fair ontologies or fair semantic resources, we already have a, a set of la standard languages and standard ways to refer to other ontologies and to reuse them, either um, in the OWL web uh, ontology language, the, you can just refer and import a whole ontology, or you can just reuse someone else's uh, URIs in your ontology. Uh, regarding the indicators, um, I, we don't really have a way to measure whether an ontology is, uh, uh, has a level or fairness or, or not. So in this sense, there is something to, to work uh, about. So how to, how to measure if a semantic artifact is fair um, should be defined for us. And also, this idea of uh, how fair is a resource uh, leads us to the to the discussion about 
to what extent do we need to reuse only fair vocabularies because it is quite strict if a vocabulary has to reuse other fair vocabularies then maybe no one is fair because you need other to be fair after you and that is a never-ending cycle and finally to to analyze the, the the practices and the needs related to how reusable is a is a resource so we can see we can say that there are already common practices from the semantic web community um, that could be reused as including licenses uh, uris or rdf descriptions of the licenses in the resources so we already provide uris uh, identifiers that point to a specific licenses for example creative commons uh, provides the, the code of the licenses in rdf or we can also generate and describe licenses and um, uh, what you can do under which uh, conditions in rdf and that can be embedded in, within your resource yeah. Uh, so, however, uh, more detail about the best practices for documenting and communicating ontologies as well as agreements on community standards should be very welcome to make ontologies more reusable. Yeah, so this, um, in summary, this is um, our view of which semantic web practices should be adopted to make uh, fair semantic artifacts. Also, what is needed to be defined or to work towards, and also which points should be discussed, whether we need uh, some more mechanisms there or, or is not needed to, to over-define the fairness of the semantic resources. So now I'd like to focus on some specific uh, practices mentioned in the, in the first slide. So, for example, uh, to design uh, the ontologies uh, URIs, of course, uh, we should um, we should define or uh, define the patterns about the ontology name and the ontology uh, namespace, and also to provide within our ontology metadata about the, the namespace of the ontology and the preferred prefix to be used, even though it only have um local uh, it is only valid locally so we should take decision decisions also whether we define has or slash uh, uris or identifiers for our terms another decision is whether our uris are going to be meaningful i mean for human humans or opaque and this is decisions that um, we should make but I'm not saying that we should take one or the other. In many cases, we would like to, it would be better to have meaningful URIs, even though they are thought for the machines, not for the humans. And in other cases, it is a best um, a strategy to have opaque or a URIs because probably we want, if, if we have a registry with identifiers, a legacy identifiers from our company or our institution, it's likely that we want to keep those identifiers to be power compatibility uh, compatible with other systems. We should define an ontology version strategy and we should use permanent URIs. Also try to um, uh, um, to keep uh, to maintain them uh, for as long as as possible having a suitability uh, plan here there are some examples of the of the designs so the name uh, the name of an ontology will be the saref extension for smart cities for example and the prefix is saref for city in this case these prefixes uh, come from a family of ontologies that are all called saref for and then the domain in this case, we define the namespace of the um, uh, ontology as the W3ID or DEF. Uh, this was uh, later changed, but um, the, good, uh, the good thing is that uh, using W3ID for persistent um, URIs, 
even though the, the ontology change uh, location and publisher, uh, we can change the redirect from this URI to the new one so that the, the use, usage that were uh, done with the previous URI, uh, it is still it is it is still redirect to the final version of the ontology. So that link, as it is um, persistent, uh, is not broken. Um, well, in this case, we have a meaningful URIs. So we say administrative area that we can read and, and understand. We include metadata about the version of the ontology, and we use permanent URI systems. In this case, uh, W3. Uh, Dot org. Also in this uh, work that I was mentioning before in the in the source in uh, is in this slide uh, from Daniel Garijo and myself. So there is a list of recommended um, metadata items for ontologies, and um, we uh, suggest uh, some recommended ones like the minimum we can have. But of course, this is also open to, to discussion. And for each uh, type of uh, property that we propose, we also propose a specific property, in this case, from a specific vocabulary. So most, most of them are from DC terms and van, uh, the van vocabulary for the prefix uh, namespace and the for the prefix and the namespace. Sorry, yeah, it's the, the prefix. And some reason that is the, the category of the of the metadata related to its uh, uh, property, and also some optional uh, metadata fields also related to the vocabulary to be used in the um, for this kind of property um, in the in the online publication and also in the in the book chapter. There are also alternative properties for this one. So, if we want to uh, to have a, a title, it could be this items, but uh, maybe also there are other other alternatives or descriptions that could be also from SCOS. This uh, uh, just to make clear, this uh, metadata fields are about the ontologies. And these uh, proposals are about uh, the terms, each class, concept, and uh, relation or attribute that appears in the, in the ontology. So the minimum and recommended one is to provide the labels and definitions. And uh, RDFS already provides us for, with mechanisms to do, to do so. And also there are some optional uh, metadata uh, release uh, properties like uh, to provide examples, uh, the status, whether the, the term is uh, deprecated or um, testing, and the source of the of the concept or the term. Again, here we propose RDFS, but SCOS could be also used or um, in some particular um, communities. And maybe there are other vocabularies that are considered standard or best practices. There is also this recommendation about generate reusable documentation uh, for um, uh, not only for machines but for human readable documentation, including good ontology visualizations that I know is the most uh, is the biggest uh, bottleneck or where we have less uh, good software to generate the, the nice visualization from an ontology. But in this case, um, we suggest uh, and also provide some tools to generate HTML versions of the OWL code for ontologies. And we propose some guidelines to generate UML-alike diagrams. In this case, those are uh, generated with this uh, notation, the chocolate data notation that is um, what uh, gathers my uh, research interest uh, these days. So that is mostly about how how we should generate the diagrams for communicating better our ontologies so that uh, it is easier for third parties to reuse our ontologies rather than generate uh, a new one from scratch because sometimes you spend more time trying to understand someone else's code that 
than building it uh, on your own. Uh, also, uh, the garden, the best practice is about um, uh, how to publish fair vocabularies. The last one is that we should publish the ontology on the web uh, and in several uh, in different formats. And this is done by uh, implementing sorry, implementing content nego negotiation mechanisms. Uh, that is, when I have a URI from an ontology, I should configure my server so that if a human uh, asks for the ontology, I will give the HTML view. Um, I say a human, but it could be also a request on HTML, but normally we get the HTML uh, when we look, uh, look at the URI through a web browser. But if it is a machine who is going to process the ontology code, then I will give the Turtle or RDF, XML, entry post, whatever uh, format I provide my, my ontology in. So if you see actually here in the previous slide, in the download serialization, we, we can have it in JSON-LD, RDFXML, entry post, Turtle, and, and many other uh, serializations. So the idea here is that um, the URI is independent of the file that is containing the, the content of the ontology. So depending on, on the request, I will give uh, different uh, files. And finally, apart from publishing so that the others can look, uh, can look up and process and make use of the ontology, we should also uh, advertise uh, or make it uh, findable by, by registering our ontology in, in existing registries or ontology indexes. So here I included some uh, some logos from some registries like the link open vocabularies that I will uh, briefly present uh, now. But there are, this is a general level, a uh, general registry that is, is there are ontologies from many fields, it's not focused in any, in any domain. But uh, you can have a specific registries like Bioportal for life science. Uh, Ontobi is kind of life science as well, but uh, has also top level ontologies, I believe. And Agroportal for agricultural domain. And I think now you have many instances of this bioportal for many domains, like uh, materials and industry as well. I think it's Mato Portal. Yes. And also, uh, as I mentioned before, you. Uh, we will be providing the prefix that we normally like to assign to our ontology. Uh, I repeat that it's also valid locally. Uh, but there is also a registry they call prefix CC that gives you like the most common prefixes for the, for the ontology. So we can also register our own prefix in this system because it is actually used for by by other tools or systems in order to resolve a uh, namespaces or to propose, for example, if you are making a Sparkle query, there are some editors that propose you namespaces uh, according to the to the prefixes or completing them for for you. So as I said, um, I will give a little bit more detail about the uh, link on vocabularies where you can promote uh, your ontologies and also look for someone uh, other ontologies that exist that maybe you can reuse in your development. So the, the mission is to promote and facilitate the reuse of well-documented vocabularies and that's why there are some rules to include your, your ontology there. And this uh, system started in the project in the French project Data Lift. And uh, since 2018, uh, it is hosted by the Ontology Engineering Group at uh, Polytechnic University of, of Madrid. So probably you, you have seen already this uh, website where the, uh, sorry. So the, the, main, uh, the main, the landing page uh, shows you the, all the vocabularies that are already within the system. 
and the bigger the um, uh, the bigger the bubble means that the ontology is reduced by more ontologies or data sets. And when we select one of the vocabularies, uh, imagine you click in one of the vocabularies, then you get some metadata about it. So you get its URI, the namespace. Um, with, uh, if there is a home page different from the HTML documentation that you get from the URI, it is also listed in the metadata, uh, the description. Uh, you will have the description in as many languages as it is. And you also get uh, information about in how many languages we are the ontology terms described. So in how many in which languages the concepts and the properties are uh, you get um, the, the names in different languages. And contributors. And also you will get uh, an, uh, these two graphs. One, uh, the first one is how popular, uh, which ontologies are, um, which ontologies are reused by the one uh, being uh, uh, displayed, and which others, uh, the other way around. This one is uh, which uh, which ontologies um, reuses the, this one, and uh, which ontologies are being reused by this one. So incoming and outgoing links. You also get some. Um, you also get some statistics about the vocabulary. So how many classes, properties, in which language it is uh, implemented. In this case, the tag the tag is like the domain, but in this case, it is a W3C recommendation. You will also find the versions, um, and you can download previous versions because Love also um, archives the, the code. And also you will find some connections with other systems, for example, uh, to generate on the fly HTML, to Eva Puris, uh, to check the uh, availability of the ontology online, and oops, that is to validate the ontologies, to eva evaluate, to look for pitfalls. So in one of the main features of LOF is to find for terms and look for terms and properties that are already defined in other ontologies. So when you enter a when you enter a, a test, what you want to look for, you will get a, a rank list of uh, elements that can be properties or classes. And the rank is about how close is the term you, in, you enter to the descriptions and the annotations in the ontology and also how popular is the, the vocabulary and how popular is the term in, link, in the link open data. But that the, the data about the term used in link open data is not uh, updated. And also you can make some filters to look only for classes, only for properties, only in specific domains or in specific vocabularies. And let me talk to you more about um, how to promote your vocabulary in this system. So you can suggest a new vocabulary and before suggesting the vocabulary, you should take into account the recommendations for uh, meta, uh, for adding the metadata description, and uh, this is important because the, um, the the inclusion of a vocabulary in LOF is not automatic. Uh, it's not completely yeah, automated, so it goes through uh, uh, the so I step in the curation team. Okay, now, and then it is. Mm, semi-automatic, we get the the data, the metadata extracted from your ontology code, but still we make some check, some checks, and if there is something to change, then we contact the authors, and then we enter the emails loop until the ontology or the vocabulary is finally included in the in the system. So the more metadata you include at the beginning. And the best, uh, the better you publish your ontology, the sooner it gets into into love. So these are, uh, as I mentioned before, some metadata recommendation based on uh, love um, suggestions and also 
de, eh, de suggestions I mentioned in my slides eh, before. So providing the namespace URI and the prefix that sometimes look redundant for the namespace, but it is not always the case. Of course, titles and descriptions in as many languages as possible, or as many languages in which you have a translated the, the ontology. Also, also, it is very important information about the, the modification, like the uh, issued and modified uh, versions, because it helps for the archiving the different versions. Of course, it is critical to have rights and property information because it is uh, very nice that we publish our ontologies online. But if it doesn't have, if they don't have an open license, then in principle they are not the, uh, reusable. You need to say that the, to the others that they can reuse it, because otherwise you can just see them online. And uh, again, for ontology terms, provide labels and comments for all the ontology terms and in many languages as possible. Um, well, and this, um, I have shown you how to use the love from a human perspective. Let's say we can look for ontologies and publish our ontologies, but love also provides the uh, sparkle endpoint so that you can query all the data that actually includes the serialization of all vocabularies uh, in the system. So you could build your applications on top of uh, this data. You can also download, download the uh, data dumps. That is the same as the sparkle endpoint uh, data. And there is also a API a REST service um, for uh, getting some data about the vocabularies. And uh, finally, well, I would just like to mention that uh, regarding this fairness of the ontologies, uh, when some, some validators are emerging, and in this case, I will just mention about OOPS, uh, that is a validation service uh, inspired by OOPS that stands for Ontology Peaceful Scanner. So this will be like Ontology Peaceful Scanner for fair principles. And then the, the system has some checks and each check has some tests. And then we provide um, an application online. And, and uh, after the scanning your ontology, you will you can include, uh, sorry, this is the application that uh, you get online. Very simple, you can only enter your ontology URI. And once it is processed, you will get some information and statistics based on our checks about how findable it is, how accessible, interoperable, and reusable it is. And then for each category, you will get the information from the test. Like, for example, inter interoperable one is metadata and data use formal, accessible, share, and broadly applicable languages for knowledge representation. So we check whether we can get actually RDF uh, from your URI, and if not, we will get a, an explanation of the of the test and what was uh, wrong. So, so there are checks associated to each principle. You can have more than one check for each uh, principle. And each check has a, a number of tests, but that is a, a more detailed and technical uh, information. So just the messages to take away from today for me will be like, a, it is, we have seen in many uh, best practices, uh, principles, and uh, in, in any guide, that the metadata is key uh, and it is one of the requirements to produce fair ontologies, but it has been also for the for the data. So, and even though we all know that we need to um, propose uh, to provide metadata, there is like no clear agreement on what uh, fields and how. So, and also that um, there is a need for discussion inter and across communities because uh, we have 
some practices in the semantic work community and maybe there are other communities like I don't know life science or librarians or other um, type of um, experts uh, and for example for us uh, within semantic web we should establish or at least to have the conversation whether we want to establish uh, me 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 mechanisms and authorities to coin persistent identifiers as the DOIs. And also, should we provide the metadata as separate objects? Uh, is that the case to make semantic artifact more fair or, or that is just a point that we don't need to, to address from the fair principles? Of course, we should look at each other to adopt existing practices and technologies. So if we are talking about the languages for representing semantics, see that there are communities that already have them so that we don't reinvent the wheel or set overkilling requirements. Uh, as I mentioned before, to be how, how to measure what is fair and then if you need to reduce fair uh, vocabularies, um, how, how fair should be the first one. So maybe we should relax some requirements and don't be driven just by this fairness uh, number. And well, I think that is all I wanted to talk to you today. And if you have any question, I'll be happy to, to answer. Hey. Thank you, Dr. Maria, uh, for this very informative and insightful, comprehensive review of the ontology with the fair principles. Um, <clears throat> actually, I uh, have a few questions from the audience, so um, I'll just present one of the questions so that you can answer to that. Um, so, Ta Tari Tarania uh, asked about the practice of getting URI and IRI. So can you speak to a little bit, um, you know, how to get this URI, IRI in the practice? So the general practice of getting this. So, well, um, so I don't see the question in the, in the panel, but do you mean how to design them? Um, how to, I think how to just, like assign or get the URI. Okay, so yeah, maybe I'll try to. So the thing is, uh, you should only coin uh, URIs in a domain that you can control. So, for example, I cannot, I cannot uh, add, let's say, add to the DCAT uh, namespace uh, a concept that I want to appear. Okay, so it will be like writing in someone else's uh, website. Uh, so the idea is you have to design URIs um, in the domain that you can control, and a domain that uh, your domain is uh, when when you have you go to the internet and you say HTTP column slash slash, and then you write um, OEG dot es. Okay, if I'm paying for that domain, that is my domain. I can I can write ontologies there, but some, uh, that will be my my uh, my own URI. But sometimes we don't have that, and it is likely that the that the ontology move from one community to another, and the website is not very stable. So you can always use Pure or W3IG there mm -hmm. are systems that allow you to generate URIs mm -hmm. and redirect them, redirect them. That means when someone writes, yeah, let me show the sample with Sarev. When someone writes uh, in their browser uh, this URI, uh, that uh, w3ad.org slash dev slash Sarev for city, um, a few years ago, it redirected to a GitHub repository when we were providing all the HTML and ontology code. But um, it was ad adopted or published by Etsy, the European Telecommunications um, Standardization Institute. And now this uh, URI redirects to the new version of the ontology that is uh, 
at saref.etsy.com, EU, maybe. So the idea is that I can redirect this URI so that the users uh, are the users doesn't don't care about which server or which final location has the the, the artifacts so that it is um, it is persistent. So the, I don't need to go to say to all my users. Oh, please, when you were uh, you were using w380.org please replace it by the new location because uh, the location is a technical issue but the uri should be independent of that it's like your name i don't know if i answer yeah thank you maria <laughs> yeah um well actually also we have another question like regarding the fair principle um so uh, Minaxi asked about the FOP ontology. So, can you uh, describe or explain about the FOP ontology in terms of the FAIR principle? Do you have any thought on that? Yeah. So, well, the so the FOP principle that is, uh, I think that is uh, related to to what I said about um, not forced to reuse fair vocabularies because um, it was here, uh, okay. Yeah, so here, uh, um, interoperable to metadata use vocabularies that follow fair principles. Then if we are going to apply this to vocabularies, we will, we will be saying uh, vocabularies, use vocabularies or reuse vocabularies that follow fair principles but we know there are already many good ontologies uh, very broadly used ones that were there before the first principle so uh, if you if you need to have this tag of uh, this is a fair ontology probably most of the well-known and broadly reused W3C and FOF ontology will like, no, now they are not good enough. Mm -hmm. So that's also why I say that, well, we don't need to, to force uh, overkilling requirements to, to that. So, and actually I haven't, uh, I haven't measured the, the fairness of the, of the FOF ontology, but mm -hmm. I also have to say that when we build uh, foops. Mm -hmm. So the idea is not like to measure and rank, it's just to provide feedback and mm -hmm. tell users what they can improve. And yeah, for sure, FOF and many other ontologies will be in the past, will be include, uh, improved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I think that this question here, the not forced to use the fair vocabulary, I think that's a very fair point. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we have another question from Ying Shang. Um, so thanks, thanks for an informative presentation on the FAIR principle ontology development. Um, well, from Ying Shang, as I'm working on a research project, uh, research data discovery uh, by users and user evaluation of information retrieval systems. So I find good connection with you know, in Jan's work, I wonder if there are specific systems that have implemented the proposed guideline, specifically a search system that use the ontology with fair principle. Do you uh, recall any of these systems you have entered, in, encountered? Sorry, could, could you repeat the, the last part, the system? Oh, sure. Um, uh, you wonder if there are any specific system that have implemented this proposed guideline like a fair uh, ontology guideline in specifically any search system uh, that used ontology um i think i don't know specifically about the search system so there mm. are there are systems ah no there are for example i don't know if you mean the combination of uh, an ontology registry with fair principles, but and then I think in a, in one of these bio portal instantiation, they are also integrating a fair checks. I don't know if Agro Portal already have it, or but there are some works in this line from Clement Jonquet. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, well, hopefully we we have news soon as we are also starting a project in the first semantics. Uh, also with the mm -hmm. I, We have another question from Jarmo. Um, is there now a fair recommendation how to create the concept identifier? For example, like being independent of the concept, um, like the ending of the URI after the slash or hashtag. Yeah, so there, there are two things. So normally when, when I do like uh, ontologies that are going to be used by an API or a system to, to integrate some control data, I will include um, uh, readable URIs so that I can also read and, and debug the code. But for example, if I were doing an ontology for a library, uh, as uh, I would probably use the codes that they had in their registries and in their systems before, because I don't want to rename things. And if they are using codes, keep the codes for the URI and then provide human oriented labels that mm -hmm. you can change without changing the, the URI. Also a good example about um, separating the concept from the meaning could be BabelNet because BabelNet is like an ontology for dictionaries. So there you have a lot of polysemy and things like that and mm -hmm. multiple um, multiple meanings for the same term and then you need to tweak the the URIs. And regarding the has and the slash, that is just a technical issue because let's imagine that the when up to the late up to the has up to the has uh, in a to, to the latest slash in a namespace, you are referring this is this is not like this, but it is better to say like this. It's like you are having different documents. Mm -hmm. So each slash is a different document. So if you use has for identifiers, mm -hmm. everything before the slash, before the has goes in the same document. Then if you are going to have a small number of concepts or terms or properties, so it's normally the ontologies, then you define has identifiers. Because uh, is, uh, when you retrieve, when you ask for that identifier, the, the server will retrieve the whole document before the has. Then uh, you count uh, how many entities I have after the has. If they are not millions, uh, you retrieve the whole document and then point to the specific entity. If you have millions of entities and you make has for all of them, when you are asking for one of them, you are retrieving all of them. Mm -hmm. So that is why normally for data you use a slash because you just point to the exact entity you want to retrieve. Imagine that they are web pages. They are not web pages, but more or less. And for ontologies, if they are small, you just do with the has. I also normally designed ontologies with the has because they are uh, reasonable so far because when i look at a, a, they are describing description logic so one term refers to another and database into another so probably in my application i want to look at ontology as a whole i don't want to be asking term by term every time i find them in another definition mm -hmm. so that's the that's the thing that is mostly technical like mm -hmm. if you include the slash, it's like a new document. Mm -hmm. I, I repeat, it's not exactly like that, but just to, to understand between us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And then I just you know want to bring this up that Mike actually share um like a search system, like a metadata based search system, search uh website. So anyone who are interested in that, you can check that check that on. And the Inja also comment on your answer. Um his observation also like the information retrieval community is so much distant from the semantic web community. So we should we have more collaboration between the two community. Uh, and then another uh, question from Anas. Um, 
maybe I'm not really familiar with this term like ontology design patterns, but I'll ask you, um, you know, like anyway, so do you think the ontology design pattern should be recommended as a way of making ontology more interoperable? I think, well, um, so there are different kind of patterns. So um, some in some cases you have patterns that are like uh, design patterns, like the NRE relation, because in RDF we don't we only have binary relations that every time we need to associate a third entity, you need an NRE pattern. Mm. And that is not like a building block. You don't have like a code for NRE and then you reduce because it can be applied to, to any domain. And there is, a, I don't know if you are aware of this portal, the ontology design patterns.org. It is a wiki with the, all the patterns and the review and so on. And yes, at the end, they are like a modular or building blocks for ontologies, but you will have to stem them. So I think, I haven't come to the case where I use the patterns to increase interoperability. I have more experience about using the patterns to define my model, like from a design perspective. It helps me in the conceptualization, but not so much in the, not that much in the, in the implementation. Also because if you are using many patterns, probably you are having a um, Mm, high number of namespaces and the more namespaces you have the more namespaces you need to control within your data and within your Sparkle queries so that to reduce them thank you um i'd like to continue discussing and then taking more questions um but i think we should be mindful of a time so yeah, I really appreciate this informative and then again, very comprehensive review of the FAIR ontology and the guideline. Um, and then thank you everyone uh, who, you know, like participate this discussion. If you have any further question, which I do have, <laughs> if you have any follow-up question, please. Um, Dr. Maria, is that okay if, if, if other people like email you about, you know, this FAIR ontology? Yeah, I included in my slides my uh, email and my Twitter account. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so please feel free to reach out to her. I'll do the same. And then again, thank you very much. And then thank you for everyone joining us. And thank you, ACES, for organizing this webinar. Thank you for inviting and having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Maria Poveda for presenting this very interesting webinar. I also want to thank Inkyung Choi for moderating the session. I want to remind attendees that one of your many ACES member benefits is complimentary access to all webinars. A recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides will be posted to the ACES website by tomorrow and will be available to all ACES members and paid registrants. Within 24 hours, attendees will receive an email with a recording of the webinar and a survey. I encourage you to complete it within seven days. Again, I'm Aminta Dawson with ACES staff and I thank you for attending today's webinar. This concludes the session. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Wing Jun. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria. I, I may again uh, be connecting with you about this because it was very interesting for me. Yeah, uh, again, I appreciate uh, leading this webinar. So keep in touch. Thanks for inviting. Really yeah. nice. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.